Hey there, Calc Kids. This is Mr. Bean from flipmath.com. In this video, we're going to look at the 2022 AP Calculus free response questions, and this is from the test BC test, problem number six. Now, that last problem on the AP exam is almost always something dealing with series and convergence and divergence and all this crazy stuff. It's a serious question. <laughs> so when I saw this thing right away, I thought, oh, this is just sine x, right? The ones that we had to memorize, sine, cosine, e to the x, those things. But then I realized, ah, they tricked us by not putting a factorial. Right? If we had a factorial on this, factorial, 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 then this thing, if it was factorial, if it was, then this thing right here would be sine x. That's what it would represent. So that threw me off for a second when I first looked at this problem, because I had to recognize that it didn't have a factorial. So uh, let's take a look at what we do here. We're going to use the ratio test and find the interval of convergence of the power series for f. So what we focus in on is this general term here. That general term gives us every single term. So what we're going to do is the ratio test, we're going to take the limit as n approaches infinity of, and then I'm going to use this thing with an n plus 1 plugged in. So that is where this comes from. I plugged in an n plus 1 into that n and, when you, and, then, and into this n. And when you simplify it, you get this. And then you multiply by the reciprocal of this original which is just this thing. Now you could see here, because it's absolute value, the negative one to the something power is just gonna go away. Or you could think of this as they cancel, top and bottom here. And then what else can cancel? Well, the two n plus one and the two n plus three, those are definitely not going to cancel. But I do have some things here in the x's that cancel. And if you needed to, you could even think of these x's as this here, because this two n plus three becomes two n times x to the third. And then you can see that those x to the two n's are going to cancel, and all you're going to be left with is an x squared. Okay, so all of this simplifies to this, and then because we're having n approach infinity, we're just thinking as this approaches infinity, you get 2 over 2, which is just 1. So now this is going to equal the absolute value of x squared. And for the ratio test and for finding the interval of convergence, we're going to say that when does this thing, is this thing less than 1? So you have to think through how can x squared possibly be less than 1? What values can you plug in that make it less than 1? It's all x values that are in between negative 1 and 1. Okay, so this is very close to the answer for the interval of convergence. But if you remember, when we do this ratio test for testing interval of convergence, we also have to check the endpoints. So now this is a bit of a pain. What we have to do is check the endpoints of this series here and plug in a negative 1 into x, into that x there. And then we also plug a 1 into that x. So let's, I'm going to make a new page here so I have more room. There, that's a little better. So let's test the first endpoint. So let's look at, uh, at x equals negative 1. What happens to this series? So I'm going to have, I'm going to have my series from n equals 0 to infinity. And I'm plugging a negative 1 into this x. And that's what it would look like. So as we plug in numbers into the n, what's happening with this series? Well, this negative 1 is causing it to be alternating. So it's going back and forth. But then you have to check this. Is it also alternating? So let's see here. Any number you plug in, 2 times that number plus 1 will always be odd. So this will always be odd. This will always be negative. And then this one's causing it to uh, alternate back and forth, positive, negative, positive, negative. So yeah, this thing is alternating. And then this denominator is just going to grow. So you can see this thing is going to get smaller and smaller. This is definitely converging by the alt. So I'm going to write converges by the alternating series test. This will be getting smaller. The, the magnitude of it, I should say, is getting smaller and smaller. Okay, what about when x equals 1? Let's test this series. We're going to go from n equals 0 to infinity. And I'm really ho horrible at making my sigmas. And uh, what are we doing now? We're going to say negative 1 again. But this time, the x there, that x is going to be just a 1. And that doesn't matter what the power is. It's just 1. So it's negative 1 to the nth over 2n plus 1. This is definitely alternating. And we've done a lot of these before in BC. This also is going to converge. As the denominator grows, it's also shrinking. It's getting the magnitude of it. It's getting smaller and smaller. So it's going to be converging by the alternating series test. So we've tested the endpoint. So we know now that the final interval of convergence is going to be negative 1 inclusive. We're going to include negative 1 and we're including positive 1. So you could write it like this for your interval of convergence, or if you wanted to use interval notation, you would do that. Either one would work. 
So this interval of convergence, we this this uh, part A had two different lessons associated with it. So 1013 and 107. And the reason I put both of those lessons, 1013 is on the radius and interval of convergence of power series. So we did that quite a bit in this one. And then 107 is alternating series test for convergence. So you had to understand the alternating series test for convergence, as well as finding the interval of convergence of a power series. All right, let's take a look at part B. Part B here is asking if the absolute value of f of 1 half minus 1 half is less than 1 tenth. Now, the first look, you're like, what in the world is this asking? What are they trying to get us to do? Well, let's take a look at what f of 1 half is. So that, that might help us see a little bit more of what's going on. If I just plug in a 1 half into each of these x's, here's what it will look like, this pattern here. So it's just all of the x's become a 1 half. Now, if you remember the alternating series error bound, that alternating series error bound is that if you have an alternating series that converges, which is what we have here, we have this alternating series that is going to converge, then you use the alternating series error bound, which means if you sum all the way up, like if we wanted to know the sum of the first three, the one, two, three, those first three terms, then the next term, the fourth term, would give you your alternating series error bound. So what's really happening here is that this f of one half minus one half is the alternating series error bound. So let me let me write the statement here, but it might make a little bit more sense. All right, so let's see if this makes sense. One half is the first term of the series, right? So we have if we plug in a one half into x, then one half is the very first term. Therefore, the alternating series error bound is the next term. This is the next term. So th that thing, the absolute value of it, is the error bound. Now, this is allowed because if we plug in a 1 half, this series is an alternating series that converges. This thing is going to approach 0 with each term. So each term's magnitude is decreasing in this alternating series, so it converges. So we're allowed to use the error bound. So now what that does is that means that this thing would have to be less than the next term, which is the absolute value, I should say, of the next term. Negative 1 eighth, 1 half cubed, over 3. Well, if that is equal to, we do the arithmetic there, we get 1 tw over 24. And 1 over 24, we know that is less than the 1 tenth that they were asking us to show. So we showed that it had to, that this thing is equal to 1 24th, which is less than 1 tenth. So where did we talk about this alternating series error bound? That was in lesson 10.10, .10, right there. Alternating series error bound. All right, let's jump now to part C. And part C is thankfully a bit easier than a lot of the other parts on number six. So even if you couldn't have done the other ones, hopefully you at least jumped and tried to do this one. So we're just asked to write the first four non-zero terms uh, that represents f prime. So if this is f of x, then f prime is just the derivative. So we've got to do the first four zero terms and the general term. So you just take the derivative of each of these first four terms, which is here, and then you have to take the derivative of this term here. So you could either try and come up with a rule for the first four, or you just take the derivative of this general term here. And if you think about the derivative, it's the 2n plus 1 would come down to the front, and then that 2n plus 1, since it's in front here, would cancel with that 2n plus 1. So all you'd be left with is negative 1 to the nth, x to the, and then this 2n plus 1 minus 1, if we're taking the derivative, and there you go. So there's the first four non-zero terms and the general term. And this is from lesson 1015, because 1015 was the very last lesson that we covered, which was representing functions as a power series. So that one's a bit more straightforward. You literally are just taking the derivative of each term. But now for the next part, part D, we're going to use this thing for part D. So we're going to use the result to find the value of f prime of 1 16th. So let me copy this over. So there's a couple of ways to approach this part D. I'm going to show you the fastest way, but this only worked if you had memorized the pattern. So do you remember back in, uh, in lesson 1014, we were to memorize these, e to the x, sine x, cosine x, and then also 1 over 1 plus x. If you recognized what these things are, then you could jump to shortcuts. You could just know what the series notation is. So that's why I kind of on this problem, I thought this, this series might have been the sine x, but it was missing the factorial. So if you recognize this one right down here, this looks very similar to what we have here. 1 minus x squared plus x to the fourth, 
right? It's This is 1 minus x plus x squared minus x cubed. Like they're very, very close to each other. So if you could recognize that, then we know that this 1 plus x is the function. So the difference is that instead of 1 minus x plus x squared, we have this thing. Oops, I forgot the f of x here in front. So what we're really dealing with is we had 1 minus, so this is this series. So notice what I did here is I just recognized that this is exactly the same thing as this one, is that the x gets replaced with an x squared. So all the x's got replaced with x squared to make it match. So in other words, the function for this, instead of being 1 over 1 plus x, it would be 1 over 1 plus x squared. Okay, so that is the function for, I should say f prime, darn it all, f prime. It wasn't f, right? Yeah, this is f prime. Sorry, that was a little confusing. So f prime is equivalent to 1 over 1 plus x squared. Now that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it, and I won't go through that whole thing on this one, there's other videos out there that you could find, which would be just recognizing that each term being multiplied, this is geometric. As you multiply each term, you're multiplying by a negative x squared negative x squared. You're multiplying each term by that. And so that's the other quick way of doing this. If you recognize that it was geometric, then you would know that your little r here that goes in, remember this, 1 over 1 plus 1 minus r, not plus, minus, that it would be 1 minus negative x squared. Okay, so if you could recognize the geometric, that's another way of doing this, and that would just lead you to this. And then from here, it is literally just plugging in the 1 sixth. So f prime of 1 sixth is equal to 1 plus one sixth. And you could just leave the answer like that. That's good enough. I would stop right there. If you wanted to keep working out because you love fractions and you just like playing with fractions, then this answer would be 36 37ths. Now, what lesson is this from? This is 10. I say 10 14. And the reason I say 10 14, finding Taylor Maclaurin series for a function. And the, the reason I say that it's 10 14 is because that's where you recognize these special things here. And so if you could have just seen that, then you could jump straight to that equation right there and then plug in the one sixth. All right, hopefully this was helpful to you. This is Mr. Bean signing off.